It is uh, an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. It's great to be with you. So what's new? Anything going on? Nothing much at all. <laughs> Just, you know, Rudy and Donald, I don't know. <laughs> You've been in politics for quite some time. How does this rank as far as uh, on the outlandish scale for you the last 48 hours watching this transpire? Uh, 18 out of 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, this, this, is, uh, this is kind of bizarre. And, uh, you know, uh, it's... Uh, Rudy Giuliani is a great character witness the president has. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's hard is... to believe he was mayor of New York at one time and seemed to be doing an okay job. I mean, it's like his body was, has been taken over by another being. <laughs> I didn't know the president could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's more powerful than we realize. It is almost like you and, and President Obama left the door to the White House open and a bear got in. It is... <laughs> It's crazy. It's... <laughs> have you heard from President Obama this week? No, I haven't. You have not? No, I have not. No. <laughs> you, you guys don't talk about this kind of stuff? No, we don't talk about this kind of stuff. Is there a gossip element to this sort of thing, or is it just trouble you? I, it, look, it, it's, you know, when you step back from it, it, this is not about me and my family. There's not one single solitary... Uh, legitimate journalists in the world have given any credibility to this. They've debunked all of what he's had to say for the past, since Giuliani started this a while ago. But um, what, I, what I do worry about is I do worry about all the other families that can't take care of themselves and what, what's happening with this president and his constant diversions into... Look, we want to get his attention, have 70 polls in a row showing you beating him. And that all of a sudden gets his attention. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why I'm the object of his attention. But look, there is much more at stake than, uh, than whether or not uh, he's acting so bizarrely. This is the idea that someone would call a head of a foreign state ahead of time withhold significant military aid that's badly needed in order to prevent the Russian separatists who are in, in Ukraine from taking over Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and then ask, uh, basically, to can you cooperate with uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani? He's coming over. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and the thing I learned, we learned, we all learned recently, is that statement that uh, the 2,000-word statement released was that um, talked about getting the Justice Department engaged in this. I mean, it's, uh, it's such a blatant uh, abuse of power that it's uh, it, it just... Uh, I don't think it can stand. Yeah. It's, well, do you think it is an impeach impeachable, this particular instance is an impeachable offense? Based on the material that they acknowledge today, it seems to me it's awful hard to avoid the conclusion that it is an impeachable offense and a violation of constitutional responsibility. But look, that's, I am confident in the ability of the House and Senate to deal with this. My job is just to go out and flat beat him. Um, uh, and, 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 and so I, what I can't let happen, I can't let this distract me in a way that takes me away from the issues that really are the reason why I'm running. This is a fundamental reason. This overwhelming, uh, we have to restore the soul of this country and, and uh, who we are, the, our values. And, and the idea that we're not paying any attention he doesn't want us to pay attention to health care, which you and I both know a lot about. I need to not do anything about dealing with the environment, not do anything about the rampant abuse of guns on, on our streets. I mean, so many things, let alone the international issues we have. I mean, this guy embraces Kim Jong-un, talks about he believes Putin over his intelligence community. I mean, the damage being done is monumental. How much of your desire to run is related to Donald Trump being president? In other words, if someone, if a decent man like Jeb, Jeb Bush had won the Republican nomination, <laughs> would, would you feel as motivated to run? Uh, I guess the honest answer is no. The, look, I hadn't planned on running again. Uh, when, uh, when my son passed, um, uh, I... He made me promise I wouldn't tell anybody how serious this circumstance was. So my staff still thought we had a campaign in waiting. Um, and uh, when I went out, uh, 
uh, to tell the president that I told him I was definitely not going to run after a boat passed. Um, I, uh, he said, come down to the White House and to the Oval. We'll go out in the Rose Garden. You make an announcement. And, uh, and I said at the time when I walked out, I, I knew I'd be asking a question to have any regrets. And I said, I have one. But I wouldn't be the president that get to preside over the end of cancer as we know it, because I had done the cancer moonshot and we'd made so much progress. And, uh, but even then, I, I hadn't planned on running until I saw those people. Not, not a joke, Jimmy. When I saw those folks in Charlottesville coming out of the fields, carrying torches, contorted faces, their veins bulging, shouting the same anti-Semitic bile that was shouted in the streets of Nuremberg and Berlin and throughout Germany in the 30s, accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan. And when the president was asked, when a young woman was killed, asked to respond, he said, well, there were very fine people in both groups. No president has ever, ever, ever said anything like that, with the possible exception of Andrew Jackson before the Civil War. And that's when I decided, how, how can I, I've spent my whole life doing this, uh, how, how can I remain silent? Because I was raised by a dad who taught me silence is complicity. This is the way that he's tried to divide this country and the way he has pitted people against one another. And you saw it didn't just end, at, you know, with, with Charlottesville. Look what happened in El Paso recently, you know, we're gonna, a young man saying, I shot all these people in the parking lot because there's a Hispanic invasion. Well, the president just, we had, in the 2018 off-year campaign, kept showing that video of people marching up, we're being invaded by Latinos and Mexican or rapists. And, and this division in our country is just so devastating, so devastating for so many people. And it's ruining our standing around the world in a way that is going to be hard to replace. Look, we can probably handle four years if he doesn't get us in a war in the next year. And I'm not being a wise guy. I'm not being glib saying that. But eight years of Donald Trump will fundamentally alter the character of this nation, in my view. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't, we, we can't let that happen. What are your thoughts on, because I know that one of the things you believe strongly is that we can reach across the aisle. Democrats and Republicans can work together. You have many friends who are Republicans. In fact, Lindsey Graham today said he considers you to be one of his very good friends, and then said, <laughs> you know, and then he, he tagged uh, something unpleasant onto it. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't more Republicans standing up and saying, hey, this is this just, we can't go along with this anymore? Well, look, um, first of all, I, I, I don't know with any degree of certainty, but I do have a sense that uh, most of the time when a Republican is beaten in a state that is a purple or red state, meaning Republican or Republican leaning state, they're beaten on the right. They're not beaten in a general election. They're beaten in a primary. And Donald Trump has sort of, uh, he's got the entire Republican Party, whatever, it's 34% of the public or 38, I don't know, but he has control of that part of the party. And so if you take him on, everybody knows how vindictive he is and how he'll go after you. And so there's a great concern. For example, back when, when they were holding up before uh, Trump got elected, they were holding up uh, um, the nomination of the, the president put forward for the Supreme Court, Merrick a really, fine, Merrick, a really right. fine man. And, uh, and they weren't going to hold hearings. And I called literally 12 Republican senators. And I said, you know, this is a terrible thing to be doing. You're setting an awful precedent. Every one of them but one acknowledged that. But they said, well, you know, if we do this, if we call for hearing, the, the Koch brothers will drop 10 or $12 million into our campaign, and I'll have a race, or Joe, I still have a primary. It's just gotten doubly worse since Trump's gotten elected. And I, I'm of the view, look, our politics is broken, not the system. The politics is broken. And it's gotten so mean and ugly and divisive that uh, um, I, I just think with him gone, there's a chance for to breathe new life into what everybody knows has to be done. For example, at the end of the last term, the thing that's very personal to you and me, healthcare, I care greatly about it, yes. you do too. And yeah. by, by the way, I want to thank you. Not a oh. joke. Thank oh. you for literally oh. saving. Oh. No, no. Oh. no, 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 no. no. Don't underestimate what you did, pal. 
You well, fundamentally you, say because, as you pointed out, folks like you and I have gone through some difficult times. At least we've had the wherewithal and the coverage and the help. Imagine all the people. If, if there were lights around, I bet if I asked all the people out there who have a, had a child that they lost to cancer or had a serious disease or a serious problem and had real, real, real concerns about a family member who's an extremis, raise your hand if any of you went through anything like that. Too many. And, and imagine, look at all the people out there, Jimmy, who are doing this getting up every day, putting one foot in front of their face, what you faced with your, with your child, what I faced with my son, and, uh, um, and ha ha didn't have the help we had. They're heroes. They get up every day. And I made a commitment, and I mean it, that if I'm elected president, I guarantee you I will protect your family's health care just like I protect my own, as if it were my own, because it's personal. <laughs> Vice President Joe Biden is here. We'll be right back. Mr. Vice President, if President Obama had, at, at some point during his presidency, put you in charge of an imaginary thing called the Space Force, would you have gone <laughs> along with that? <laughs> is, that is that something, a duty you have agreed to take on? <laughs> the good news was that I worked with a really fine man. Um, <laughs> The deal we made, he asked me, uh, when he asked me to, to join, I was flattered, he asked me to join the ticket, which I did, and it was the best decision ever made. But uh, one of the things that worked, Jimmy, was he, we made a deal that we would always be blunt with one another. And we, we had lunch every single day when we were both in the country, and we would be completely straight with one another because I asked him why he wanted me as vice president. He said, because I know you'll never come and be intimidated by the office. You'll tell me what what's on your mind. And, uh, and so we've had a great relationship. When he's given me authority, he gave me presidential authority he, because he knew I knew what he wanted. He knew I wouldn't do anything contrary to his view. And the good news was we agreed on 99% of everything. When you speak to young people, I know you're out talking to a lot of people all the time. What is the number one subject that, that they bring up? I think the number one subject, it, it, believe it or not, it, it, it fluctuates between climate and guns. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the generation that is most anxious about their future today are people between 15 and 21 because of guns. They ask, what is the worst thing? What, what are they most concerned about? They're concerned about going into school and getting shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and they, also that the, the idea that our planet is, is... And secondly, and more importantly, quite frankly, on the long run, is our planet is real, in real, real difficulty. We should be acting as if, like John Kerry says, as if we're, we're declaring war here. This, is, this has to be a war on dealing with climate change. It, it is that consequential. at the Obama administration, which obviously you were a major part of, do you wish that you'd done more at that time well, actually, we did an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we invested uh, over $100 billion or $90 billion in, in climate change. I, back in, way back in 1986, introduced the first climate change bill requiring us to f change our focus, et cetera. Why did you start thinking about that in 1986? Because I could see what was happening in my state. I could see what was happening. Species were beginning to be lost. We found ourselves, we have a lot of wetlands from along the Delaware River and down the Delaware Bay. And what was happening is they were going to, they wanted to build refineries. And I ended up being able to block them by changing the zoning. And we ended up with the first Coastal Zone Act where nothing can be built within a mile of those, of those wetlands. But because I saw from the folks at the University of Delaware and the marine biologists that how much was changing. And, you know, the pollution of the waters. And look what this president's done. Every single basic rational piece of legislation and or or, or, or change we made from the CAFE standards, how many miles a car can get, need to get, all the way to not allowing them to dump sl uh, coal mines, to dump sludge in rivers, et cetera, to dealing with mercury. Every one of those he's walked away from. And, and, and not just that, acted uh, against. And, and oh, no, no, well, he's, he's taken them back, allowed them to be, in, uh, 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 allowed the polluters to continue, and he goes to the G7, doesn't show up at the climate, uh, uh, meeting. He ends up at the UN, doesn't want any part of the climate. Look, look at what that... I, can't, I wonder whether there's ever been a president or a, 
there probably have been other heads of state in other countries who've spoken, addressed the UN, and not a syllable was heard from any of the members of the United Nations in support of anything. Just silence. Yeah. Silence. Maybe he figures since he lives most of the time in a tanning bed, it doesn't matter what happens <laughs> to the climate. <laughs> well, look, look, there's so much we can do. Well, I, I, I am, look, America is better positioned today than any time in my lifetime to lead the world on everything from climate to cancer to dealing with rebuilding the middle class to bringing the world together. I mean, we have the, we have the most significant research universities in the world. We're in a situation where we have more great, great research universities than all the rest of the world combined. We're in a position where our workers are three times productive as workers in Asia. We have, we lead not only by the example of our power, but the power of our example. We have, we have so much going for us. And I think it's time we, as Americans, just stop feeling sorry for it. Lift our head, this is the United States of America. There's not a single thing in the United States. I really mean it. There's nothing beyond our capacity. Nothing once we set our minds. Mr. Vice President, are you saying you want to make America great again? I'm saying <laughs> I want America to be the envy of the world again. <laughs> yeah. That's that would be nice. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Joe Biden, everyone, he's running for president. Thanks for watching. If you liked that video, click the subscribe button. And if you didn't like it, well, you hurt my feelings.